Um, I teach primarily in fibers. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our guest today. Um, before we jump into any of that, just a courtesy reminder to please silence your phones out of respect. Um, and I would love to begin um, with our land acknowledgement. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, with respect that we are gathered today on Kalapuya Elihi, uh, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dis dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the Coast Reservation in Western Oregon. We express our respect for all federally recognized tribal nations of Oregon. This includes, uh, includes the Burns Paiute, um, the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Siusla Indians, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, um, Community of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians of Oregon, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, uh, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquel Indian Tribe, the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians, and the Klamath Tribes. We also res um, express our respect for all other displaced indigenous peoples who call Oregon home. So it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Jesse Herod today, who we're very pleased to have with us. Um, Jesse is an artist whose practice explores embodiment, gender, and sexual identity. They work in the spaces between fiber art, painting, sculpture, and hobbyism, using a broad array of media, including painting and drawing, sculpture, macrame, cast brass, animation and felt, among other things. Adopting amateur crafts steeped in the material vernacular of 1970s feminism, such as macrame, Jesse supercharges hobbyist traditions materially and conceptually. Building on historical feminism, Jesse aims to synthesize her stories hmm, with <laughs> her stories um, with contemporary take on queerness and how this fusion can contribute to the development of queer aesthetics. Their work with macrame is further compli complicated by their use of colorful synthetic fibers like paracord, um, which is a utility cord devised by the military in the making of parachutes now used for a range of purposes, from recreational camping to um, survivalist prepping. Jesse is keenly aware of the irony and contradictions of using a material that has militaristic and masculinist overtones, which they first procured from a tactical shop catering to survivalists and gun enthusiasts in, in, in Virginia, right, in Virginia, for the purpose of making queer art. I recall hearing them speak in the past about one of their seminal installation pieces, Taut, Tight, Tender Sway shown at the Sculpture Center in New York in 2017 and being drawn in by the complexity of the work. One of the things that strikes me especially about this work, um, particularly that piece and others, is the way it creates multiple experiences for its viewers through its porosity. Much of Jesse's work features a central motif of portals, alluding to doorways, keyholes, curtains, and the female body. It does through it does so through a controlled riot of colorful paracord, spilling imagery, and unselfconsciously sensual materiality. Jesse's work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, and they are represented by um, Fleischer Ullman Gallery in Philadelphia, where they mounted a major solo show last year titled Tough Nut. They come to us today from Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia, where they serve as the head of fibers and material studies. Please join me in welcoming Jesse. All right. Thank you so much. Um, switch, switch glasses. <sighs> Hi. Um, okay. I'm not nervous at all. Um, so I want to dedicate this talk to Next Benedict. So I'm going to try and speak. Wow, that's dramatic. OK. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm gonna try and speak for 30 minutes or so, probably a little longer, um, but I'll definitely make sure there are time, there's time for questions and you'll wave at me if I'm going on too long. Um, thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to meet with the grad students today and see the campus. I've never been to Oregon and this is the fastest trip I've ever done to the West Coast, um, but it's been really exciting and I, I can tell I'm already gonna wanna come back. Uh, this is very early Jesse Herod work. Uh, this is something I made for my mom as a kid, um, but it certainly set the stage. And I want to just give a little bit of reference or framework rather to my background. Um, I'm originally from South Africa. I came to Canada as a preteen. We lived in Toronto and then I went to Nova Scotia where I went to the, oh my God, they, they make these crazy names for schools, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design University. Um, and then I attended the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. Um, I come from a complicated background of community organizers, activists, and writers. And I worked as a community organizer in Toronto, Halifax, and then I moved back to South Africa for a number of years where I did work as well. As a community organizer, I was largely facilitating community arts projects, predominantly with HIV positive teenagers, new immigrants to Canada, and young people with addictions. Through doing these large-scale community-based projects, I was able to work as an artist, but I was largely realizing other people's projects and not my own. And at a certain point, it became clear to me that I needed to do my own work. And so that's when I went back to do my, uh, my BFA. And I'm very thirsty and I'm a little sleepy, so bear with me. Um, okay. moving me along. No, it's not. Here we go. Why is that not moving along? There we go. So um, I go back and forth on how to give one of these talks. Uh, in some settings, uh, I talk specifically about new work, what's current, but because this is an educational space, I felt like it was important to kind of dig back into some of my earliest work. So I thought I would talk about um, my thesis work, because I do think it sets sort of a, a groundwork or a framework for how I continue on in my practice. Um, I also think it's important to talk a little bit about this place. So when, uh, it's not a great image, but it's the only one I have. So um, when I did um, go back to do my BFA, uh, after having studied at the University of Toronto and doing gender studies, I went to Nova Scotia College of Art and Design University. Um, and I focused on textiles, painting, and sculpture. And during that time, my ex and I bought this store that was already named uh, Venus Envy. We didn't name it that. Uh, and we were an education-based sex store. And we were selling textbooks for local universities and providing uh, healthy sexuality classes in store and in community spaces, as well as selling a ton of sex toys. So this foundation of gender studies, sexual health advocacy and education, and social justice work has informed my art. And it leads me to understand what artistic traditions I work in, queer, feminism, and post-colonial. In thinking about these traditions, I'm aware that they all lead to larger conversations about class, access, labor, and resources. And those all tie really neatly back into a discussion about fiber. So moving on to my thesis show, which <laughs> is sort of the bane of my existence in terms of uh, the size of it and the amount of space it takes up in my studio. But, um, I, it sort of shows where my kind of interest in research and materiality comes from. So I've always made installations, sculptures, and paintings that foreground queer imaginations of kinship and community. I view my sculptural works as inhabitants of queer communities. So this piece, Frosted Pink Lipstick Smeared Across His Face, is an installation I made in 2010. It's made from cheap pre-printed cloth, sequins, paint, foil, laser-cut masonite, metal pipes, and flanges. It's 20 feet wide and 10 feet high and comes away from the wall five feet. The fabrics I chose for this installation were cheap synthetics. They're imitating higher end chintz fabrics. I collected cloth from domestic spaces and I tend to prefer fabric and materials in general that look like the underdog of the material world. Trying really hard to be pretty, pulling out all the stops, but falling short in so many ways. This work was informed by my interest in theories of performance and the construction of gender. The front surface of the work is faux in every way. And by faux, I mean it's covered in sequins and embellishments that we generally see 
in costume or in fashion to obfuscate parts of the body, in a mostly in a fashion context. But when you look, look at the work from the side, you see the large metal flanges um, that attach it to the wall that sort of create uh, like a stage set. But because you can see it from the side and from the front, it sort of creates a backstage onstage relationship. The relationship of this cloth to colonization, trade, and class was at the root of this piece. And in a contemporary context, the word chintz means something really different than just describing a pattern. It suggests something is poorly made or in bad taste. It's chintzy. I'm interested in making work that uses materials or an aesthetic that challenges our idea of what is appropriate materials, what is so-called good taste. And in doing so, I'm raising questions about material context and the relationships with hobby, craft, fine art, low art, and high art. And I'm so thirsty. So I don't know if you guys, there's a, there's a documentary about the Cockettes. It used to be on Netflix. I don't know if it still is. Um, but I think it's, it's definitely on YouTube. So while I was making this work, um, I was researching a group of uh, performers and drag artists from the 60s and 70s in California called the Cockettes. And drag for me is a concise way of exploring constructions of gender. The Cockettes were a collective in the 70s, and as art historian Julia Bryan Wilson states in her article, Grit and Glitter, they were equal parts experiments in communal living, theater troops, and active promoters of radical new modes of queer and feminist self-fashioning. They performed cabaret acts at local venues in the Bay Area, wearing elaborate makeup and costumes. I generally want my work to kind of reference this aesthetic, not high-end glam, not polished, but a homemade DIY drag and performance. The other influence in my work that's been pretty consistent is the ethos of punk and glam rock, taking things into your own hands, flipping them upside down, and putting them back out in the world in a new configuration, one that bucks conventions. So I'm going to move on now to the first uh, I'm going to skip over different things uh, in the interest of time and also so I don't bore you. Um, but I'm going to move on to the first show I did that really was macrame based. So after grad school, I taught at, TIA, at SAIC. I don't know what TIA is, but SAIC for two years until my visa was on its last legs. And I needed to either get a full time job or return to Canada. And I didn't really want to do that at the time. Um, so I decided I would give up the big city of, of Chicago and move to Virginia uh, to take a job at James Madison University. Is anyone here from Harrisonburg, Virginia? Okay, so I can be honest. Um, <laughs> this presented new challenges that I think changed my work and ultimately changed my life. Living in small town Virginia where feminism created hostility, I reacted by becoming further politicized. In my own teaching, I had to start at the basics with familiarizing my students with the feminist art movement, anti-oppression, post-colonial theory, de decolonization of craft, queer theory. Well, also at the same time, I was learning about American history. I didn't take American history in school. I didn't know about Jim Crow. I didn't know about redlining. I didn't really understand the Civil War. Um, I really knew nothing. And I'm still learning every day. But by preparing the lectures on early fiber artists for my students, I started to experiment with macrame. And it's a technique that I haven't used for years. I'd never used it in an art context. I'd used it with my mother as a craft project when I was a kid. And I've always been really hesitant to use macrame. I really felt that it, it referenced my mother's kind of 70s aesthetic, which as most young people, I, I resisted anything that was her. Um, but in the US, uh, that sort of second wave feminist movement was largely white, middle class, and straight. But my mother didn't grow up in America or in Canada for that matter, and her visual world was a combination of radical black communist South African politics and colonial European aesthetics. Um, I realized that, that the technique of using a visual language of the 70s does something. It brings a layer of meaning that can enrich my work. By playing with scale, color, and materials, I can make macrame contemporary while also remaining in conversation with formative second wave feminist art that although it had many blind spots was important. So these are three, this was the installation that I, I did in a show with Erin McIntosh um, in, uh, um, at VCU in Richmond. So this realization that, 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 material, that not just material but that technique had history and meaning and was embedded in the work was really important to me. 
When thinking about my work and its relationship to queer theory and identity, I've been very much influenced by growing up in a police state in South Africa, where my family and friends were often incarcerated and where survival was a constant concern. Coming to Canada under less than perfect circumstances, we were forced to make our lives outside of the conventions that other families seemed to be bound to. Queer lives and sexual practices, like craft making, often rely on do-it-yourself strategies of creativity. There's no guidebook or inherited cultural roadmap for lives lived outside of normative structures. I hope to relay the same sense of self-determination, inventiveness, and resourcefulness that I have experienced and witnessed within queer lives and sexual practices, such as the invention of new forms of pleasure, the arrangement of unconventional family bonds, the often makeshift development of sex toys and devices to amplify same-sex experiences within my work. So not only do these macrame, macrame pieces incorporate accessories of gay sexual subculture, but the unconventional and overlapping shapes of the suspended forms, I hope, also suggest alternative ways of being or hanging in space. In all of my work, my choice of materials is fundamental. In fiber and materials studies, the location of the materials, the patterns such as chintz, the quality of the cloth, whether woven, macrame, or printed, all provide context for the work. I'm interested in the way that the layering of technique and the material can form, create, or so rather can create meaning. So, and yes, I did find the paracord at um, these kind of survivalist stores. I felt like I was liberating it, uh, even though it was pretty scary going <laughs> into some of those places. Um, after two years in Virginia, um, I was able to move to, to uh, Philadelphia, and it's a city fraught with issues, and I think it's important to state that I didn't um, land in a place free of conflict, racism, homophobia, and transphobia. Philadelphia is one of the poorest cities in the country, with 25% of its population living, living under the poverty line. That being said, it's a bigger city and um, was a, be a better fit for me, for sure. So this is a show called Rangers uh, that was a solo show I did in New York. Um, I made these frames so that they were precisely my portion, my, uh, my proportions, my height and my width. Um, this meant I had, uh, in some ways, I was sort of facing, face to face with my body, pulling the rope tight like a skin and manipulating the forms, opening up new ways for me to consider my work and the relationship I have to my own physicality and strength. I'm interested in the ways that building and making can become automatic when the knowledge of the doing becomes muscle memory not unlike playing an instrument or a sport, when your physical self and your intellectual self are in sync and you feel like you can fly. So this next body of work I wanna talk about is a show called Toxic Shock and the Hot Dog. Um, and for this show, I wanted to embrace my drawing practice alongside my sculptural work. I was also really uh, invested in being honest about the things that made me laugh and how humor is a form of survival that I rely on heavily in my life and work, and I'm sure many of you do as well. On one side of the exhibition, uh, the two mascots hung, and you'll notice the names of my work are really important to me. I spend a lot of time thinking about language and naming my work, uh, and we can talk about that later in the Q&A. Um, so the mascots, unlike the rangers, they were sort of netted and they weren't pulled tight, in the same way that the rangers were, I let them hang. The work is self-reliant. The structure is only stable through the support of itself. They read to me like bodies or garments, and I drew the colors from cheap sports bras and fast sports fashion. On the opposite side of the room, I built a false wall that curves like a skateboard ramp. I've long had a love and involvement with music. My partner is a musician, and in particular with the scrappy DIY aesthetics of punk and glam music. I decided to create my own fictional band. They're called the Vagina Touchers. Wanting to make rock posters, I made three original drawings for the band, and then I printed them um, and had them plastered on this curved wall. The sculpture doubles as a wall that supports the posters for the band, layering the foe upon the fictitious. This installation highlights the blur between surface and depth, enacting and unworking the relationship between supporting structure and artwork such that the support merges with the surface. So around this time, I was asked to develop a monograph, um, which is an incredible opportunity and an incredible gift. And I entitled it Low Ropes Course. 
Um, but I felt really uncomfortable with the attention all on myself um, and just on my work. Uh, and I was also really aware and continue to be aware of the incredible people who have supported me and my practice and how influenced I've been by different artists uh, throughout my time in the US. And I wanted to talk with some of those people and highlight their work. So I put together a list of people that included Laurel Sparks, J.D. Sampson, Alison Mitchell, Danny Orendorf, Lisey Raskin, to name just a few of the amazing queers I've been able to work with. And I set up interviews with each of these people, um, coming up with different parameters for us to engage with. Uh, many of these conversations were centered around music as it's integral to my practice. And the book, book includes interviews with these folks, images of their work and other artists, as well as letters from folks that I've, I've had connections with. So an example of one of the parameters, uh, Laurel Sparks and Lisey Raskin and I um, made playlists for each other, which we then listened to and then got together and sort of like tore them apart in a sense. Um, and by doing that, we also ended up talking about our art practice. All right, taut, tight, tender, sway. <laughs> um, so this was a, an enormous opportunity for me to, to do a site-specific installation in New York. Um, uh, oh my God, what is it called? At uh, <laughs> Sculpture Center. Um, and it was really great because I had, in the basement of the building, there is this uh, long kind of tunnel hallway uh, that sort of feels like it would house a subway car and um, it has that kind of shape. Um, and I wanted to make work that people could would interact with um, and not just sort of stand at a res respectable distance, but they could really get immersed in. Um, and so part of that meant that I had to give it permission to fall apart and, and allow it to get damaged. I made 25 panels that hung several feet apart and the viewers were able to walk through the panels, touch the panels, and as they walked, they sort of lapped against their bodies. Uh, and obviously people stepped on them and damaged them, but again, that was that sort of sense of impermanence and allowing the work to have its own life outside of me was very freeing. And this is a detail shot. I realize I'm talking really fast now. So um, <laughs> I've done a number of outdoor installations, and it's funny, we talked about that in one of my studio visits today. Um, I really struggle with having the paracord outside. I, I, I really don't like how it looks after a very brief amount of time. It starts to look kind of terrible. Um, so any kind of site-specific outdoor piece that I've done has to have like a fairly limited life outside. Um, but this piece I did called Hatch um, in LA at Clock Shop Bowtie. And this is a, weirdly a park that winds along the LA River. It's essentially a concrete park. Um, it's a complicated space with a complicated history as so many public spaces are. It really lacks any physical landmarks and it feels abandoned. While at the, si at the same time, there's a plethora of site-specific art throughout the space that pull you through. I wanted to create an installation that would make a sort of splashy entrance while also feel fragmented and complicated. So I decided to work with a defunct transmission tower um, that was situated a few meters in from the from a, a transmission tower that's fully in use. I was thinking about technology in all its iterations. In fiber, technology is often overlooked. People often forget the loom or knitting needles are technology. And I think my choice was also influenced by my desire to engage with materials, peoples, and places that are seemingly discarded. You could see the tower from the highway that goes by the park, and the materials I used were largely glow in the dark. So they were, they were visible at night, even with all the light pollution of LA. I wanted it to feel like a billboard as a way to draw people into the space. Um, and I, th I think it did that. And it stayed up for about a year until it really started to fall apart. The paracord, you know, it's essentially oil. Like it, it, so it, it retains its color um, for quite a long time. Some colors fade in the light, but for the most part, it, it stays fairly rich in color. So moving right along, um, mending and repair. So this was a show uh, before COVID. I wonder when we'll stop doing the before COVID, after COVID thing, but I'm still very much in that mindset. Um, so this was pre-COVID, and it was a collaboration with Lisey Raskin, um, who runs a sculpture program at RISD and who did teach at Tyler um, before this show. 
So we were invited to do a two-person show at Fleischer Ullman in Philly, and we decided we wanted to make a show that was in response to their enormous collection of visionary artists. I'm not comfortable with language. Uh, I feel like we haven't really figured out the kind of language that we need to talk about uh, untrained outsider. Like all of these terms feel sort of um, pejorative to me, but. Regardless, uh, Fleischer Ullman has this extensive collection of, of outsider artists. And so we spent two years uh, visiting their collection, spending time with their collection, researching the artists that they have, um, and narrowed, and I narrowed it down to two artists. Lisi narrowed it down to her two artists. Um, and for me, it was Eugene, and I always have a hard time with his surname, Eugene von Brunch Brunchenhain. Um, so he was a Milwaukee-based self-taught artist. He was active in the early 1940s through the 80s. He lived in a house with his wife, who was also his muse, Marie, and he created a world of highly original beauty steeped in idiosyncrat idiosyncratic synthesis of non-Western art and architecture. They did a ton, they did something like 80,000 photographs of her. Um, he had all these theories of cosmic genesis, uh, he made ceramics, he worked with chicken bones, he did paintings. I mean, it's incredible what he did. And most of his collection now lives in, um, at the Kohler in their art preserve. And if you, I mean, it's sort of in a strange place in the middle of nowhere, but if you ever get the chance to go to the Kohler art preserve, it is one of the most spectacular uh, exhibition spaces I've ever seen. So he was someone who immediately through color and form, and I mean, I, just looking at this, I can see how that, for me, connects to the kind of paracord work I was doing. The other artist that I was completely overcome with is, is Joseph E. Yoakum. Um, and he is known for the artwork that he did during the last 10 years of his life, largely drawings. Uh, he had a storefront live workspace on Chicago's South Side. Um, and um, his work really, uh, in, in, in a sense, captured his travels that he did when he was a younger person. But we only know that from the handwritten inscriptions that revealed the locations on the back. So places like Vermont, Montana, Mexico, Slovenia, Sweden, France, and Italy. Um, and I, you know, again, these, I'm just so blown away by both of these artists and the work that they did. Um, and you'll see how Joseph's come, comes back into my practice. But there's like a kind of fragmented, way that he draws um, and abstraction, which we'll also talk about in a minute. So at the entrance to the show, we brought back a little bit of taut, tight, tender sway. So we had, I think um, there's four or five of those uh, sort of screens is how I think of them at the entrance to the show. And, um, and I wanna just talk for a minute about abstraction because I do think it's important in my work um, and in meeting with some of the students today, it's important with some of their work as well. So David Getze, I feel like, is probably the person who's most well known for talking about queer abstraction. And he was a teacher of mine in grad school. He now works at the University of Virginia. And he's written extensively about queer abstraction and argues for a broader and more inclusive understanding of abstraction that embraces its potential to challenge dominant narratives and empower marginalized voices. Historically, queer art in a Western context has often been about being seen, confronting people with our existence as a political statement. I'm interested in how queer can be aligned with the idea of something out of place, something that's wrong, or, be, or being seen or understood as different. I fully embrace this, um, this way of living, this way of making work and building my world. My use of abstraction is deliberate. It's not a pushing away from the form or the physical because my making strategies are so clearly tied to a haptic and embodied relationship that's self-evident in the work. Those who explore abstraction through a queer lens can choose to make it difficult to see the questions around sexuality. Regardless of the form of address in the work, queer abstraction is no less political. And that can be a very contentious statement for some folks. So this piece, Laughing, um, very much came from looking at, at Joseph's, Joseph Yoakum's work, as did uh, Sack River. So Getsy talks about how queer abstraction ties, uh, tries to think through the ways that camouflage and disassemblance might be used politically di to disrupt. Queer artists often use abstraction queerly to prompt us to see differently 
And that's what in part also makes it political. Queer abstraction often emerges from the desire to vex representation. And I love this idea. It resonates with my sort of punk beginnings. I also see a power in the idea of hiding in plain sight, that the work might speak directly to queer audiences without others knowing. So along with the drawing and the macrame works, I've, I've also done a number of stop motion animation. And I'm going to show you one next. Um, and it's a little bit explicit, but it's all kind of poorly hand-drawn images. Um, and I don't want it to start just yet. OK. So this is um, called Tender Buttons. I think it's about three minutes long. And um, when I do my, my stop motion, um, I'm really interested in keeping them really lo-fi <laughs> and really simple and really jerky. Um, I want them to sort of, again, uh, contain that sort of punk ethos that I grew up with. So we'll watch this.
Stop that there. Um, nope. Okay. So, um, so obviously humor is a big part of my work, and uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it, it to me does feel like a form of survival. And I think that there, I think of Bell Hooks a lot, and I think about the ways that uh, her writing is accessible and is as incredibly complicated, but is written in such a way that you can read it. Um, and to me, that feels like such a political gesture. And um, I sort of feel like that is an important part of my practice, is, is borrowing from her to some extent. So this is the last show I'm going to talk about um, called Tough Nut that um, um, Sonia referred to earlier. So this work, everything really shifts uh, quite dramatically. I spent a semester at the Kohler Residency in Wisconsin, and this experience was incredibly hard and profound, um, and it, it really influenced my work. So I, I took discarded bits of macrame pieces uh, from my work, and I reconfigured them, making large molds and poured brass. The process was in part about alchemy. Simply put, alchemy is the study of, and philosophy of, of how to change basic substances. Um, alchemists believe that lead could be perfected into gold, diseases could be cured, and that life could be prolonged through transmutation. For me, transmutation is taking a thing, breaking it down to its component elements, then reshaping those elements into something new. This again aligns with my earlier comments about queerness. So these are, uh, they're all sort of roughly different sizes, but they kind of exist in this framework of three, three by four feet. Um, they're, they're shockingly heavy, um, and they are all hung on the, on the wall. I went back and forth for months on the issue of color. So much of my work relies heavily on color, and it, it is my, my most favorite thing is color. Um, and I, I did a ton of tests. I spent so much money on, on ways to treat the surface. Um, but in the end, I realized that the brass should just be left as brass. So each piece was ground and polished and then sealed. The forms I create uh, created connected to bodies, shield, and armor. Some of them I made multiples with different materials. On the left is the brass, uh, and on the right is silver with, or, or rather is iron with silver leaf on it. I also did a series of drawings. So using the casting sand essentially as paper, I carved into it and poured the brass. And these are sort of smaller, they're the sort of largest they get. This is probably the largest one, it's about that big. And they're quite thin. It was such an interesting experience. Um, this show was last, was about a year ago now. Um, and I'm still sort of figuring out the experience because it was completely all consuming being there in the factory and then working on the pieces afterwards. But we are actually in the process of building a foundry at our studio. So it, it's had a lasting impact and um, we're currently learning how to um, work with aluminum. So there's a couple more images of this. So this show had two rooms. And so one room was the brass works and the other room, and this is, these are the final pieces I'll show you, um, were some macrame works. Um, my, my partner is a carpenter and we started working together on frames a little over a year ago. Um, these pieces, there's, there's two in this series uh, that made it into the show. Um, and they're much more topographical than my earlier works. Um, again, you know, I feel like I'm still learning about them. It usually takes me a couple of years after making something to spend time with it and build language around it. As well in the show, I had never shown these before, but um, this is the final kind of component that I'll show, with you, show you, is these felt pieces. Uh, I usually make about five of these a week. Um, they're a stage in my process for the macrame works. Um, 
these are, I've always sort of considered them studies. They're stitched felt. And then if I really like one of them, then I'll, I'll have uh, Lee make a frame for them. So these were in the exhibition as well. They often offer me a way to think through form and color before I scale that up into a larger macrame work. Um, they very rarely stay the same. And the one I'm going to show you is, is, this is this is a study that was translated into a larger piece, um, which I'll show you now. So it really deviates from the original, but in many ways the felt offers a lot of information for me to work with. Um, my relationship with materials is crucial. I'm always invested in the conversation with their histories and abilities, and I see often as a collaboration with me and my materials. They take on their own life form in the studio. Every time I start to work with rope, I learn something new. And I'm guessing that when that stops happening, when I stop learning something new, I'll, I'll work with entirely new material. So I'm gonna close with this quote from Donna Haraway, um, which I won't read to you, but hopefully, oops, you'll take the time to, to read it. Um, but she's someone who's been really important in my practice as, as, as a research space. Um, and if you're not familiar, I really encourage you to read some of her work, as complicated as it is. Um, but thank you so much for listening to me. And if you have any questions, this would be the moment. Do I keep this on? So I will run this microphone around to whoever would like to question, comment. We are recording, so please do use the mic. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed your colors. Thank you. Really vibrant. And I was interested at the end when it wasn't color, but you explained why. So I look forward to seeing that. And are your animations, are they available? Yeah, they're, they're all on the website, okay. on my website, yeah. The website. So the other question I had was you talked about the titles and how important that is to your work. And I was at a, a presentation last night with Leonardo Drew, who just numbers his. Yeah. And says he doesn't, and the reason he does it, he doesn't want people to have any, if his to influence what people are seeing. And I was just curious um, what your thought process was about how your titles are important and are, and are you like, urging your the viewers to think about it in a certain way? Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm invested in them influencing the viewer. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, sometimes it's code. So like Tender Buttons, um, you know, Gertrude Stein, like not everyone is going to get that reference. And so I, I think sometimes it's a way of, of finding different parts of my audience and, and sort of letting them in on something. Other times, uh, it's, it's very genuine. I, 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 the titles come through making. I ne they never come after. Um, so while I'm working on a piece, I'm also cultivating language around it. Um, and, and oftentimes there's, the, there's humor in that and there's pathos in that. So it feels, it feels in enormously important. And, and I think that they also indicate or give clues to what the work is talking about as well. We can talk about anything. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you have ever had to fight for space for your work to be described as sculpture, since it is fiber based, and what that experience has been like for you also. That's a great question. Um, I, I often feel. Uh, imposter syndrome running a fibers department <laughs> because I'm not, uh, you know, I, the ways that things are separated in a university often is because of money and bodies and not really for any other very good reason, um, in my opinion. Uh, we, you know, I teach at a school that's enormously interdisciplinary. Um, and my undergrad at NASCAD, we didn't have majors. So I, I was a painting in mostly took painting classes, but also took fiber classes and sculpture. Um, 
so I, you know, in, I don't think in the art world things are separated so much like that, or at least that hasn't been my experience. Um, I think that if anything where there is tension is the kinds of materials that I use as opposed to the fact that it's fiber based or it's a fiber technique. It's rather that I'm using something that's considered like lowbrow or hobbyist. That become, that's such, so much more of a kind of contention as opposed to um, the technique, if that makes sense to you. And I think that also um, you get to a point in a career where people want you to continue to do the same thing all the time. So I think oftentimes the issue might be more, well, there's drawings. How does that fit in? Or you know, th these things are doing this, and now suddenly you're introducing this other thing that's doing something else completely different, whereas in my head, they're all tied together. So that is another area where sometimes there's tension. Um, is there any advice that you would give to somebody who's looking to deepen their relationship with materials through all of the different explorations that you've done? That's a really lovely question. Um, I mean, there's so many different kinds of artists. I'm definitely uh, the kind of artist that can spend an enormous amount of time alone in my studio with my materials. And before COVID, I had studio assistants. Uh, we lived in, in the city then. We've since moved to the country. Um, and I haven't found people that I want in my studio yet, but I'm sure that I will. Um, I think I overly romanticize my materials <laughs> and, and really sort of see them as, as another kind of figure in the room that we're in a relationship with. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm really invested in kind of exploring a process or a material to the nth degree um, and, and really pushing it as far as I can and not, not giving up on it. Um, so for, for me, that's just the way that I approach making. Um, and I guess that comes to some extent out of like, a, like NASCAD is very much a craft school or it was when I attended that space. So there was this kind of ethos of, of learning to do something well, whatever that means. Um, which I don't necessarily think is the case at a lot of uh, spaces now. Like there isn't that kind of push to, to be a really amazing weaver, um, except for I'm sure Havencio is different. Um, <laughs> but um, I feel like a lot of times my students are really kind of good at a bunch of little things, but like not, they don't have a thing that they're kind of entrenched in, in a sense. And I think at NASCAD, that was a really a big thing, was that you had to learn how to do something really well. And that has really influenced my relationship with materials. <coughs> yeah. Lovely questions and answers. Who else? Valencio. I was going to say, I'm, I don't teach them to weave at all. <laughs> no. I'm curious. I'm, I'm like kind of formal. This thought has sort of <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, it's such a joy to, to hear you talk about your research, especially the influences of so-called visionary artists. I think a lot of folks who like grew up in the Midwest intellectually are somehow like really, uh, it's a big part of, <laughs> yeah. of my experience of, of Chicago and Wisconsin yeah. and that area as well. Um, but that, my, that has to do with my question. Um, I, I love how you describe humor um, as a kind of, as a, uh, necessary for survival um, and a particular kind of survival. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, you know, that humor in sort of classical sense is about like a disruption or like a, a reversal of expectations of a certain situation. And then I also think about abstraction as sort of like um, in the way that it can point away from language. It, it is a kind of dis disruptive in mm -hmm. that way to our expectations of, um, of our perception. C can you relate humor and abstraction um, a little bit in, in I feel like I, I've been trying, as you've been speaking, to do that myself, but maybe yeah. you're here, so you, you, <laughs> you can tell us a little bit about that. I, I, that's a really great question, and I don't know if I can answer it yet. Um, one of the things that I, I sort of give myself permission to do is, is, is to make work and build language later. So the titles come while I'm making, but the sort of, the sort of larger understanding of what I'm doing often comes after. 
Um, and for me, abstraction has been, you know, it's, it's been integral to my work for a really long time. I left out a lot of pieces that were much more um, direct in their address and, 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 you know, there's a lot of vulvas that have been made over the years. But um, certainly things have become far more abstract probably in the last five or six years. Um, and there's not, do they want to come in? No. Um, <laughs> there's not a lot of, of really good writing about abstraction through a queer lens. I mean, I think David Getze kind of um, is the, the, main, the main person who's written about that. And, and there are a few others, but, but not a ton. And, and I, you know, when I think about abstraction uh, through, through the sort of painterly lens that, that I got from undergrad, it, it, it was such a, like, a self-important thing. Um, and I can just never take anything too seriously. It doesn't matter what it is because, because life is too short. Like it's just, you know, like I just can't see the value in that. Um, and so I'm not entirely sure if I can answer that, but I know that there's a connection and that is, that is my current research is thinking about queer abstraction and writing about it and figuring out how those two things. So I love that you hit on that because that's exactly where my brain is at and trying to sort of bring those two things together. Um, yeah, so maybe we can talk more about that. <laughs> I have something to say about that um, yes. <laughs> and I'm still forming it as well, but um, I, as you were speaking, I was thinking about um, like the visionary artists in um, Wisconsin, um, like Eugene, that guy. Um, <laughs> EVB, I just call EVB, him EVB. Okay, great, uh, and others um, that uh, so much of their exploration was actually like um, abstracting the materials that were around mm -hmm. them and, and conveying the space that they lived in at a time when, you know, sort of realism and um, sort of, uh, you know, traditional landscape painting, might, uh, portrait painting may have been more, um, you know, the sort of uh, middle of the uh, art that existed in other sort of areas, more sort of educated areas. Um, and I thought about this in relationship to, um, you, you used the word like hobbyist, and mm -hmm. I think about um, amateur a lot as mm -hmm. like the root of that word being, f doing it for love. Yeah. Um, and just wondering about these visionaries and, and like if, if through, um, through love, <laughs> the space around us becomes abstracted. Yeah. And love is another form of like humor. Yeah. Um, I think those, those like exist together. So I don't have any, I, I want to continue this conversation also, but I just sort of thought about that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that, like when I think about abstraction, like sort of the sort of our historical understanding of it and that sort of modernist painting, like this whole thing of like separating the heart and the brain from the making and from the intellect, like it just for me feels so patriarchal and problematic. And I, I love, I love in the studio, you know, like that is, that is, it is an emotional, it is emotional. That doesn't mean I'm not also thinking and being smart. But those things, and I and I feel like s Western education has really screwed that up for people. <laughs> um, and I'm that's a battle. Someone asked earlier, like that's a battle. I feel like I'm constantly fighting as an educator. Is is and and I look forward to talking more about this. But this this thing of of you can have feelings and make work and and have those things be all connected. Like your body is one thing, you know. Um, but to me, it feels that feels like a very queer move. Agreed. Who else? <laughs> um, kind of related to what you just said, I was curious what your opinions are about like the way that maybe human sexuality is obscured in like a lot of different kind of fields, less so in art, but like in computers and math and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Because I was sort of thinking about like the possible harm of accepting that. Like there's this one image, I won't like it, but there's this one image from like a Playboy thing that's been used for like most of image processing up until the last maybe decade. And I'm curious, like, I guess there's like positives and negatives of acknowledging how maybe the more human elements of, I don't know, creating things, of, I can't quite finish, but. Does that make sense, kind of? Like, so I was curious what your thoughts on how people kind of obscure that in fields are. It, obscure the, the human body? 
like or the th- role that kind of humanness and sexuality plays in developing things? I, th- I think I'm understanding. Um, I mean, okay. I, I do think it gets obscured. I th- I'm, and the only, th- my point of contact with what you're saying, I, I feel might be oftentimes when I have shows, people want to put a warning sign up at the entrance to the exhibition. And I don't think there's anything in there that is terribly explicit. Um, but just the, the, just the fact that there might be a penis or there, there might be a breast is uh, considered potentially offensive. So I, mean, I don't know if that's in line with kind of what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I don't know if I have an answer to that, but I do think that there is this desire to obscure and to sort of separate our heads from our bodies. Um, and I'm really interested in putting those two back together and making things explicit, but not gratuitous. I think that those are kind of different things. Um, in, in an act of celebration. Mm-hmm. Any last questions? These have been great. Okay. Well, thank you, Jesse. This thank has been you. so wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.